right now, the only thing that seems to be stopping more scenes like this on the south coast is the weather. The government has repeatedly promised strong action to stop the boats coming, but cooperation with the French is a distant prospect. The government's other tactic is to change UK law. Part of the job of the Nationality and Borders Bill, say the government, is to more closely limit who can claim asylum in the UK. But it has many critics. Some say the government is abandoning its international obligations to those fleeing persecution. Others say it simply won't work. I think it will fundamentally change the way the UK has been seeing itself in the course of the years as a proud protector of refugee rights. The starting point of our asylum law is the 1951 Refugee Convention, which the UK has signed and in part sets out our obligations to those who come and claim asylum. Article 31 says that those who enter the country illegally cannot be prosecuted if they do so to claim asylum and they come directly from a state or territory where their life or freedom was threatened and present themselves to the authorities without delay. Exactly what those words mean is disputed. The government says this would allow them to treat people differently depending on whether they came through so-called safe countries on their way to the UK. This is an interpretation that the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and many immigration lawyers take issue with. That really has no basis in law. Uh, the, the 1951 convention to which of course the UK is a party and indeed was one of the, one of the founding parties uh, does, does not allow for a, a differentiation between refugees on the basis of the way they arrived. The government though is under extreme pressure from elements of public opinion and the Conservative Party to try something. I think the significant point here is that virtually the entire population of many countries around the world would be granted asylum if those people made it successfully to the UK. So we can't have a position where the relatively wealthy people, understandably wanting a better life for themselves, get to effectively jump the queue. We've got to find a new way of looking after, for example, Syrian refugees. This rather anonymous looking building in London is the upper tier appeals tribunal for the immigration system. And if that sounds rather complex, well, the government say the whole system is in desperate need of streamlining. The whole process from beginning to end, they say, takes far too long. According to the Home Office, it takes on average more than a year to make an initial decision. The refusal rate at this stage has fluctuated over the years. According to the latest figures, just 42% of claims are turned down. Almost all of these, though, will then appeal at the first tier tribunal. Then, if still refused, some can apply to the upper tier tribunal. If the claim is still not successful, there is the option of using the courts potentially all the way up to the Supreme Court. And anywhere along the way, there is the option of applying for judicial review. When refused, some applicants simply begin a new claim on different grounds and the whole process can begin again. The government says the bill will streamline the process, limiting rights of appeal and the introduction of new evidence. The risk, of course, is that we send back a genuine refugee to a country where they are, in fact, at risk of persecution. Um, so I think that it's important that we take our time and we consider those matters and that if the government really wants to expedite the, the asylum process, then it's worth investing in high quality decision making rather than trying to bypass legal safeguards that are there for a reason. But processing claims is one thing. Removing unsuccessful claimants is something quite different. Many such removals are blocked by the European Convention on Human Rights. Yesterday afternoon, the statute was formally signed. It was signed in 1950, and it's interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which has, through successive judgments, broadened its scope and impact. Lord Sumption is a former Justice of the Supreme Court. He says, in effect, it makes many removals almost impossible. The proposed bill doesn't actually deal with that problem at all and there's not much that a bill can deal with it because the structure of international law, including the Human Rights Convention, um, it can't simply be unilaterally changed by the United Kingdom, short of withdrawal. If we want to reform human rights laws in this country, it isn't the EU we should leave. 
but the ECHR. Our parliament needs to have the right to say, no, that's not where we want human, law, human rights laws to apply. It should not undermine its own reputation by going over national decisions where it doesn't need to. At various times over the past decade, senior Conservatives have floated the idea of withdrawing from the Convention altogether. Now, though, Ministers say that may not be necessary. We might simply change our interpretation of it. Labour says the government plans just won't work. Next to no consultation with key partners on this bill before it was published, we've seen those amendments being tabled at the very last minute. They've been writing this bill as they've been going along. The situation could not be more serious, so we've absolutely got to find the solutions. But we couldn't be any further away from the international cooperation that's going to make it work. We need better from this government. It's not the bill that's before us this week. It seems likely that the government will get its bill through the Commons when it votes on Wednesday. But what's not clear is how much practical impact the legislation will have on the problem that ministers say they're determined to solve. That was David Grossman. Well, joining us now, Labour's Diane Abbott and Sir Christopher Chope for the Conservatives. And Sir Christopher, if I can start with you, because you'd actually like the government to go harder and further than it currently is. That's what your amendment's suggesting, isn't it? Yes, I'd like the government to deal with the issue of people who are already in the United Kingdom illegally. And there are probably between 1 million and 1.2 million such people. And currently, it is not illegal to be in the United Kingdom without lawful authority. Most people think that that's ridiculous and they don't even understand that that is the law. But it, you, it's criminal not to have a television license, but to be here as a foreigner without lawful authority is not criminal. So just to clarify, if somebody came on a boat seeking asylum, let's say, from a war-torn country, as soon as they set foot here, you would want them to be considered a criminal. Is that no, right? No, I wouldn't, no, because I'm talking about without lawful authority. And, and I, I, I'm not concerned about the, the asylum aspects of this bill because I think that's, uh, the government can explain that. But what I am concerned about is that every year there's probably an increase of about 90,000 people who are here illegally. And the majority of those people are people who arrived either clandestinely or came with lawful authority, but then their visas expire it, uh, and, and so on. So those isn't, isn't people point, are not being removed because at the moment it is not illegal for them to continue to be here. Isn't the point that you, you don't actually know when somebody arrives whether they are an asylum seeker and, and a legitimate seeker of asylum or, or not? Exactly. But the issue is, in, in my amendment, is that if you are in the United Kingdom without lawful authority, then you would be committing an offence. And if you are a genuine asylum seeker, you would be here uh, with lawful authority. But if your asylum claim was rejected, then you would no longer have that lawful authority. Diana. We can't put ourselves in a situation as a country when we're, as we would be, criminalising asylum seekers. These could be children coming to uh, reunite with their parents. They could be married persons trying to reunite. I mean, you cannot criminalise seeking asylum. The, the right to seek asylum is guaranteed under international human rights law. So uh, what do you do with that, um, Sir Christopher? Because... If people arrive here and they're seeking asylum, then presumably they do go through the system and, and nothing would change, even with your amendment. Well, my amendment is dealing with the people who are here without lawful authority. OK, let me and just bring just it down on that one, then. A genuine okay. asylum seeker is, is here so with what, lawful authority and unless and until their claim is rejected. Sorry, if their let me claim just, let me for just bring asylum is Diane. rejected, then they are here without lawful authority. I probably do a lot more asylum and migrant casework than uh, Mr Chope. And the truth is, many people who may not necessarily be here lawfully at a point in time could be lawful asylum seekers and could get asylum. You can't tell that at the beginning of the process. You, you would concede, presumably, though, that the small boat's route into this country is horrific, dangerous and should be discouraged. Yes. And the asylum process is not working. The small 
boat route is horrific, as we saw. 27 people were drowned a few weeks ago. But the answer to that is, first of all, for the government to have better cooperation with the French, not to be so adversarial. It's like some Tory MPs are trying to rerun the whole Brexit debate. We also need to stop peddling, well, the government needs to stop peddling stupid ideas about wave machines. But thirdly, and most important, we need to establish more safe and legal routes for asylum seekers to I, come I think here. we have been here before, and yeah. we never found any uh, evidence that the government had actually been, Pretty Patel had been talking about wave machines. I say that to you, Dan, because we've been here before, and you said last time that you'd retract it because you had never found evidence of Pretty Patel saying She that was either. quoted as saying that. She was, and she never said it. Well, I, I have to defer to her if she said she never said it. But my point, most important point, is about safe and legal routes. There was a system which Alf Dubs um, tried to promote where unaccompanied children yeah. could, could enter the country. Um, the people ought to be able to apply for asylum at, at British embassies overseas. Do, does it matter to you, um, Christopher Chope, if those safe and legal routes are disappearing, if, if they aren't being offered up by your government? No, what, what concerns me is that uh, people who are coming here as economic migrants are using the cover of the asylum process in order to jump the queue well, and get into, the, get into this country ahead of people who apply for visas. Indeed, one of the victims, sadly, on, on that tragedy in the, t in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the channel was somebody who had come from Iran in order to join uh, their boyfriend here right. um, as a surprise. That was, that was not an asylum seeker. That was somebody who wanted to come here for a better life. And, and I don't blame people for wanting to come here for a better life. But if they get here and they are here without authority, okay. then they should be prosecuted so Diane, and regarded what, what as criminals. What do you do then to separate people who are just choosing the economically advantageous route versus the people who are fleeing for their lives? You make it possible for them to go through the asylum process in a speedy manner. That's what you do. There's a tremendous amount of delays. I do these cases before, a tremendous amount of delays. You cut out the delays and make it possible for them to be processed properly, and then we will know whether they're asylum seekers or not. And that, um, as we heard in the film, needs high-quality decision-making um, as an investment. Uh, should we be prepared to spend much more money as a country in speeding up that process and making sure that we don't make mistakes in it? Yes, we should. And, and the, the Public Accounts Committee last year made it clear that the immigration enforcement branch of the Home Office is really not up to, not up to scratch. And they, they got a lot of employees, but they're not effectively protecting our borders and ensuring that people who should not be in this country are, are removed. There are some splits, as we've seen, between where the Conservatives are and, uh, and where the government um, is. Do, do you feel Labour's on the same page in this one? Are you happy to see Yvette Cooper, who did promise checks on immigration when she was Shadow Home Secretary, back in the front row now? I've worked for several years with Yvette Cooper on the Home Affairs Select Committee, and I'm sure she'll be a wonderful Shadow Home Secretary. Diane Abbott, do you think that she's on the right track now? I'm sure she's on the right track. Nothing else would be possible. Diane Abbott, thank you very much. Well, we're going to um, do a very quick swap in our Millbank studio. We're losing Sir Christopher Chope, and we're about to game uh, Tom Persglove, who is the Home Office uh, Minister for Migration. Tom Persglove, thanks for uh, jumping back into that spot. You, you don't see eye to eye with Labour on this one, clearly. They think the Nationality and Borders Bill is a bad idea, but it sounds like, even from your own party, um, you've got people who think you should be uh, going about this very differently. Well, I think it's interesting that the Labour Party and our opponents in Parliament say that there's a problem but offer no meaningful solution to it. And I think that that is really frustrating. I think that this issue is a huge priority for the British people. And the loss of life that we saw in the Channel the week before last was a chilling reminder of why we have to get to grips with these incredibly dangerous crossings. We have to render that route unviable. But, of course, we must also have safe and legal routes available for people, which is precisely what our policy is all about. And I would urge members of Parliament from across the House to put differences aside and vote for this bill in its remaining stages in the House this week. You haven't got new safe and legal routes, and this bill currently differentiates uh, upon people depending on how they arrive, which the UNHCR says is, is breaking international law. Well, obviously, we have a very proud record of providing sanctuary in this country to people fleeing oppression and persecution 
from around the world. And I would argue that there are many safe and legal routes that we already have established. But of course, we keep that under constant review. We airlifted 15,000 people out of Afghanistan but Minister, over the just summer. On that, on that exact point, if you can just respond to it, the bill will discriminate and penalise those looking for asylum based upon how they got here. And the UNHCR says that has no basis in international law. Do you care if we break international law? Well, I would hope that the UNHCR are as troubled as I am about these small boat crossings that we are seeing, and I'm sure that they are concerned about them. The fact is that all of these people making these small boat crossings are coming from what are safe countries. France is a safe country with a fully functional well, asylum system. So is Belgium, settling, so is Germany. No. Let's, but, let's not be disingenuous about this. They're not settling in France, are they, and then deciding that they want to come. They're starting a journey in what they will claim is a war-torn country where they're fleeing for their life and making that passage to the UK. That doesn't mean that they're, well, they're coming from a safe country. The fact is that nobody has cause to get in a small boat and put their lives in the hands of evil people smuggling gangs. Nobody mm. should be taking that risk. So you what are does not that tell leaving, you, then? you are not leaving oppression and persecution in France. And actually, the point that I would make is that some of the most valuable and world-leading work that this government has done has been directly in cooperation with the UNHCR, where we've helped some of the most vulnerable people in the region by resettling them. And they've worked with us to identify the... the uh, those seeking asylum who are most in need, and we've been able to accommodate them in this country and provide all of the right wraparound support to take care of them and to provide them sanctuary. I'm really proud of that work. We must continue to do that but at in the future. Moment, but what we simply cannot have, it. Emily, are these dangerous channel yeah. crosses. It's got to come to an end. OK, but at the moment, this does break it. So you can do two things, or I guess three things. You can either say, we're going to carry on breaking the UNHCR, we're going to carry on breaking the, the, the 1951 convention that we helped write and sign, or else you can say it's time to pull out you know maybe some in your party would quite like you to pull out of a of a treaty of convention that they say is 70 years old now or else you try and rewrite it with the UNHCR but you, you're not doing that I would argue that we are fully compliant with our international obligations and um, we are confident of that being the case and we will continue to provide safe and legal routes for people to come to this country who are seeking persecution, uh, seeking sanctuary from persecution and oppression from around the world. As I say, we provided uh, 15,000 people with sanctuary over the summer from Afghanistan. There's the BNO route from Hong Kong, which is proven to be hugely successful and, and well used. Of course, there's also um, the work that we did around the Syrian resettlement scheme. And one of the things I would argue, I campaigned to leave the European Union in the referendum. And one of the reasons for that is that I wanted a fair immigration system that treats people equally, regardless of where they well, come from in the world. And know, that is providing opportunities for, for people across the globe, which and, I really and, welcome, rather than an EU free movement policy right, like we had before. And as we heard from Theresa May, a lot of the problems that stem with not trying to, not being able to return people that your government would like to return is nothing to do with the EU. It comes down to uh, the European Court of Human Rights, um, which decides on the appeals process and makes it more difficult to deport people until there has been a proper legal process. Would you like to see us pull out of the ECHR? Is it more important to you that you get the deportation system right according to what your government wants to do, even if we aren't part of that? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial that we live up to our international obligations, whether that be through the Refugee Convention or whether that be in relation to But you to can't just say it's ECHR. important to do that and then and, say and we're the going to is, take moves that, that break those conventions, that break that human rights court. Well, the fact is we are determined to introduce these reforms through the Nationality and Borders Bill speed up case working and to get to a situation where we remove those with no right to be here more quickly. So I think that, that is a pragmatic, sensible okay, approach to take explain that. to these matters. And of course, there is this question around reform. I'm sure that you will hear members in Parliament representing that view, that yeah. they think there is a need for reform in relation to human rights. And that is no doubt a debate that we will have tomorrow. And it is a debate that we will continue but to at have the in moment, the future, no doubt. I mean, at the moment, we are part of the ECHR. And you just heard uh, Jonathan Sumption in, in David's report um, saying... We, we can't just unilaterally change it. We can't just decide we're changing it. So either you're saying, yes, we are going to deport people, you know, without a full appeals process. Yes, we are going to do that because that's what people in this country want. Or else we're going to remain functioning members of, <laughs> of the ECHR. We, we can't be both. 
I think what's important in relation to this debate is that we deliver the measures in the Nationality and Borders Bill, which will significantly improve matters in terms of the tools that we have to run a fair but firm immigration system in this country. And of course, that, in, that involves removals. We want to continue to develop returns agreements with countries around the world. Of course, countries at source where a lot of these individuals begin these journeys from, where we find that they have no right to come to the United Kingdom, but also with our European partners, our European friends, our neighbours. Um, there is a shared interest. This, this issue simply cannot be tackled in isolation. What we've got to do is continue to work together. Returns is an important part of that. I think the Prime Minister has been very clear and very fair when he says that he recognises that whilst we believe there need to be returns agreements established, there are trade-offs involved in that and there are clearly pressures um, that are affecting Europe in relation to these matters at the moment and we need to work with our partners to address them and that is precisely what we intend to do and Top we want to work with our neighbours. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us here on Newsnight.